So this is the AI stream, and th thank you for, for, for coming out for this stream. Um, you know, we've talked about it as a group of building a playbook together in one context. So this session is going to kick things off to talk about an AI playbook and around reference architectures and, and patterns. Um, and encourage you as well to, we're all on a journey together learning this stuff. You know, I really take to heart what uh, Rashad said about taking an hour a day to learn new things and we'll learn together as a community. Um, we're going to do all kinds of things, virtual and physical across the board, that we're going to work with Ted and team to sort of figure all, all, all this out. Um, so I want to welcome our speakers to talk about this subject and definitely catch them throughout the day and through the br breaks. What are you getting, what are you missing a a as well to help us help you? Turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everybody. My name is Mangesh Pise. I'm an enterprise architect with SAP. And you are in the session for AI Playbook, with, uh, where I'll be talking about reference architecture. So just a caution, if this is the flight you want to be on, stay on. <laughs> it happened with, with me once. Uh, by the way, very good to see some familiar faces I met. Um, good discussions with, uh, with some of you. Uh, definitely not arti artificial intelligence, but gave me some basic intelligence. So I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a good start between us. So uh, hey, is it advancing? Is it on? Is it on? How do we check? Oh, thank you. Yeah, see, basic intelligence. It has to be on to work. <laughs> OK. So uh, I am going to talk uh, about AI playbook and reference architectures. And I'm going to cover this in kind of two parts, two streams. Uh, and if you feel right now about the person like this, he is right now, scratching his head, looking at uh, confusing stuff, I, I'll try my best that when he turns around, he has a smile and thumbs up on his face. And so do you. So let's try that. Uh, the two, two areas that I'll be talking about is primarily about uh, how SAP has a concept of business AI and the reference architecture behind it, so that when you walk away from that, you would kind of have a sense of the building components, uh, the building blocks of this architecture. Uh, and then I will quickly switch gears and go into the generative AI aspect, because AI is AI, but there is subtle difference between how you manage a traditional AI and a generative AI. And before we dive too deep into that nice discussion about architecture, which architects like to do, uh, I want to level set a little bit on some two key messages here. The first one is why? Why even talk about AI? Right? Is there an impact? And yes, there is an impact. But I, this is a slide I specifically pulled not to specifically show what, where the impact is from the use cases. So ignore that, filter that piece of information. I think there are two key takeaways here that I personally learned and I want to share with you is each area has a different impact. Okay? Some has low impact, some has high impact. And this tells me this actually is good because it gives you a runway to actually design your roadmap for AI adoption in a comfortable manner. Right? But that said, the second takeaway is even if you touch a few AI cases in your organization, the impact is the impact could be very high. Right? So, so I think that's the key takeaway here. And by the way, this is based on where the energy was spent in 2022 and part of 2023 um, in, uh, in coming up with AI use cases. So please don't. It's, it's old. But there are two key, key messages here. The second thing is we need to address the wide spectrum of AI. I was just talking to somebody right now, and, and, and an excellent question was, there is a difference. We use the word interchangeably between different kinds of AIs. And I think we have to acknowledge that there are two different kinds of AIs. AI is not new. Uh, the AI that we know so far, in a way, has a sense of a traditional aspect to it. And therefore, we call it traditional AI. That traditional AI had a purpose. The purpose was to build expert systems, to, uh, to be able to understand and solve a specific task. And the specific task in the ML or the AI world could be something like classification, prediction, et cetera, et cetera. There is an evolution of the AI that has happened since then, in the last year or so, and that's generative AI. That's the new part. Uh, the new AI, or the generative AI, is uh, capable of doing multiple things in a single model, and that's the basic difference. In the traditional AI, one model per use case. In the, in the generative AI, one model 
can do multiple things, right? And things being uh, classification, regression, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, it generates content versus in the previous case, it was just helping us understand the content. So these are the two level sets I want to do before I get further. And let's jump directly into the, uh, the reference architecture for business AI. There are three ways in which we can consume AI. I think we have to start from the consumption side. And I'm consciously starting uh, here because I am at least fed up of using ChatGPT and figuring out how the hell that I, I, I use that in my enterprise. Right? Um, and I think, I think we need to make it consumption ready. I think that's the time right now. So there are three ways in which we can consume AI. We can make our applications intelligent. Right? Uh, that's called embedded AI. Uh, Good. I mean, there might be a few applications which are already doing that today with the traditional AI aspect. Uh, if your application is running with three letters, acronyms, uh, good luck with that. Uh, and by the way, I mean, I mean starting with ECC or E. Uh, and that's because that, those applications are still, those were not meant to be AI from back then, right? The, uh, the whole purpose was different. So uh, don't beat yourself up. The second aspect is, you can build something on the side from an AI perspective and consume it in your core application. But again, the objective there is to make your core application intelligent by running the AI capability somewhere else. And that's bolt on. And that's self explanatory. And the last and the first two things basically are uh, still from a vendor perspective. I would say they are still biased towards that because when a vendor is providing you a software like SAP, we want to make sure that the, either the application is intelligent or we provide intelligence somewhere else to, to kind of empower our own application. The third one is really empowerment to you and you being customers, partners, et cetera. And uh, that is a build aspect. So it is important that there is a reference architecture that addresses all these three cases. And it, it, as much as it leans you towards uh, incorporating or building AI or using AI, consuming AI from the core applications, there are certain, uh, uh, there may be certain requirements in your business, competitive advantages, et cetera, that will need you to actually be able to use this platform as, as a platform as well. So business applications are used by business users, right? And if our objective is to provide intelligence, artificial intelligence capabilities to the business users, we need to be able to influence those business apps today. So what happens typically in, a, in, in an enterprise scenario like this? The AI system design starts off happening in the side somewhere. Right? So uh, AI is typically you train your data, you test your data, training, testing, large amounts of uh, effort spent into that. And then in the end, uh, finally, the serving happens of AI, uh, of this uh, model. Serving is fancy way of saying, I'm going to expose an API and let an application consume it. So once an API is exposed or a model is served, uh, the business application can consume it. And obviously, the application needs to be modified or you know, adopted to ac access that, uh, that uh, AI. But then there's also a lot of things that happen around that AI, building that AI system. Managing your data pipelines, right? getting the data. Uh, well, and after that, the data scientists still have to do a lot of things with that data, classifying, you know, uh, 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 feature classifications, et cetera, with that. But then in addition, there are also other heavy liftings that happens, uh, which is not necessarily data scientists, but it's still an infrastructure-centric perspective, which is the code that is actually training the system, uh, aka Python, Java, whatever, typically Python, uh, has to be managed as, uh, as a code. It's a repository. It has to be stored in the repository, accessed, version managed, et cetera. This code needs to run somewhere, right? It wouldn't run on the laptop, obviously. It would run on the CPUs or servers, but it would also need GPUs. So that whole infrastructure management aspect of training and testing uh, your models uh, happens here in building this AI system. And now comes this new concept of uh, embedded AI. The part in the black box is there is typically the traditional AI, which is where models were purpose-built, models were built for a specific use case, and then the AI ecosystem that provides large language models or generative AI models are consumed typically directly. So just imagine as an architect, 
now you, up until now, AI was accessed through the APIs served in your environment, serving. And now when the applications need to start reaching out into these extended ecosystem, I would say, AI ecosystem, how many lines you're going to draw? Right? And I think we need to start governing that. We need to start putting some control over that. So here is one approach that SAP has taken. SAP already has a solution called AI Core, SAP AI Core. Uh, that's where the, the, the traditional AI was already provided. You could train your models. I don't know how many of you, you knew that. Right? You could train your models. You could test your models. Uh, heck, even SAP provides some standard out-of-the-box applications, like SAP Cache application. The training for that initial setup, the configuration part, also happens here in the AI core. So, so that's where that AI core component sits to support our, gen, uh, our traditional AI aspect. And then from a generative AI aspect, we kind of help put a governance layer on top of it. And that is through the foundation, uh, foundation, model, uh, foundation model access. So the foundation model access, what it does is, in simple words, it enables you, uh, you to use all these new innovations or new models from the model providers, even technology supporting AI uh, from the AI ecosystem in a, in a governed, centralized manner in the same format, linking you back to that old reference architecture. And I say the word old with a grain of salt, okay? So it's not really old, it is AI, but in the same fashion. So now your architecture is getting still simplified. It's still saying simplified. Your, uh, your core business applications, still can, applications can still continue using uh, the AI core. And depending on the use case now, whether it's generative AI or uh, traditional AI, uh, the applications can, can start consuming that, uh, that AI component. There is also a lot of operations that goes around. Uh, managing an AI project or a work stream, right? And uh, this would be specifically the ML ops role. So imagine, just imagining of the role, there is a business user, there are data scientists who need to play with the data. There is ML ops engineers who need to manage the pipeline of AI, the data management pipelines, et cetera. Uh, they, they need a special place to uh, also address this, uh, be a part of this ecosystem. And that's where the AI launchpad comes into play, where centrally you can manage as many experiments. They call it experiments in the, in the, in the AI world. However many experiments are happening, uh, they can centrally manage that and support that from the ML ops. Now, these two components, the AI launchpad and the AI core, are uh, a part of something called a generative AI generative hub. And this generative AI hub sits in SAP BTP. Okay, now that's how SAP BTP starts getting relevant for your enterprise applications, okay? But there is more. The reason this is a strategic decision of why generative AI is in BTP is because now the sky is open for us. You can start building applications on that same BTP platform, which it always had the capability to, which, is provided by, which provides you the run times to the types of Cloud Foundry, uh, Kubernetes like, we call it Kima, and then even ABAP for that matter. So your applications can run and support your, either support the core application or can be run as a, as a bolt-on or as a, as a standalone applications by itself, still consuming the same AI. So on our reference architecture is building upon something that we have provided through AI Core and AI Launchpad. And once those applications are relevant, they also start making relevant use of all the hundreds of uh, BTP services, such as databases, HANA Cloud, Postgres, et cetera, depending on the use case, and even services like integration suite, connectivity services, data management services, for that matter, from, from a data pipeline perspective, all in a single place. And therefore, this becomes the ecosystem for, for, application, for your enterprise applications to still modernize and consume the AI, plus, all the other goodies that come from business technology platform. Now, this is generative. Uh, this it covers both the generative and the traditional AI. But I will go a little deeper into the generative AI aspect because there is some method to that madness, which I want to talk through about. And, and we'll come back to this diagram and see how the generative AI aspect fits in there. All right? So far. What do you think is happening with that person on the chair in the first slide? Is he still scratching his head? A little bit better? I am seeing heads nodding, so, so that's good, okay? 
All right. So before I get deep into, uh, into the generative AI, I think we need to uh, understand some of the concepts of generative AI. So I'm going to cover two concepts uh, in the rest of the few uh, minutes here. The first concept is that of prompt engineering. And why is prompt engineering important? Prompt engineering is important is because that's how we talk to AI, to generative AI, the LLMs, large language models. The way you talk to large language models is called prompts, and there are various techniques that are applied when you talk to this prompt. And these techniques have a name. Uh, two of the techniques are called out here, which is one-shot prompt, a few-shot prompt. There are a few more. One of my favorite ones is called chain of thought, and so on and so forth. But because I don't want to make you expert prompt engineers here, I'm kind of limiting myself to just two right now. So we'll see how these prompts work so that you can, you can capitalize on that and start understanding how this thing works for the rest of the reference architecture that I'm going to paint about. This is what you have been using with ChatGPT, isn't it? Ask for the meaning of life, and ChatGPT responds you back with the meaning of life. Or, right? or ask the difference between AI core and... Yes, AI. and ChatGPT will do that eventually, but you can use our AI for that. <laughs> uh, so this, was an, uh, uh, this is another example that I want to bring around, which is about uh, a ML task. So I'm asking for sentiment analysis. Sentiment anal analysis in the, large, in the grand scheme of things is nothing but a classification, where the classification is standard, whether the sentiment is positive, negative, or neutral. right? And ChatGPT does that for us in a single short prompt. Then comes a few short prompt. Few short prompt is a technique in which you teach the large language model. I'm using the word teach carefully. I am not using the word training because training does not happen in LLMs. LLM is already trained, okay? So you're going to teach the LLM, large language model, through your instructions to follow certain, um, uh, to go through my inputs and as examples and learn from it and then figure out what I'm trying to do. So in this case, I'm going to still do sentiment analysis, except in this case, I want the LLM to not use the standard positive, negative, neutral kind of uh, labels to my data. I wanted to use thumbs up, thumbs down, and thumbs sideways. And therefore, it has done that here in this case, based on the few examples that I've read. So let's take this example. Uh, what was the impact of Hurricane Katrina on, on life? And if you, get, if you ask this to LLM, you get a pretty good response. I'm going to rush through it because I don't even want you to read this. It is a pretty good response. It's not bad at all. The question really we should be asking is, is this a good enough response? As an enterprise, would you trust it? Is this trustable response? And to answer that, we have to go a little bit behind the scenes of LLMs and look at it critically as, as architects. We have to look at its abilities and shortcomings. Few of the abilities, there are many abilities, but two of the abilities that I really want to kind of call out here. The first one is never before have we been able to talk to an LLM with uh, plain language, with plain text. And that's a pretty good thing here. The other thing is the size of the context window, which means how much can LLM understand and remember from the prompt that you provide? If the prompt is just one single sentence versus a prompt that's thousands of statements, right? And LLM has that ability to extract useful information, create an objective map of the information that is provided in your prompt to answer the question that you're asking, and we'll see that. From a shortcomings perspective, I think that the, the, the two one that really kind of I'm excited about is, excited in a, in a good way is, uh, because we can solve them, by the way, is uh, that it is not aware of the current affairs. Uh, so it does not know any latest information. And then that uh, it is sensitive to the way we uh, prompt our, our, uh, our uh, input, inputs to this LLM. So the question again is, how do we solve this? How do we overcome the shortcomings? We can overcome the shortcomings in two ways, in, in three steps. The first is, imagine there is an abundance of identified knowledge sources. Right? So this is unlimited knowledge. The second step is ability to find the exactly relatable knowledge pieces. Okay? And the third step is an LLM prompt, or a template that can be then sent to LLM for answering our questions. So if we go back to this example for a second, what I mean is I'm trying to show here. So if we take this same prompt 
And we imagine that the internet is the whole knowledge source. I've done number one, and I've identified my knowledge source. And if within that knowledge source, I have been able to identify that Wikipedia is the knowledge piece that I want for my, uh, for my LLM to be aware of when, I'm, when it's answering, that's my step number two. And then I go back to building my prompt, which is step number three, along with instructions to how to use that information. And here I'm asking it to look at this information and then provide answer to my question. So look at the highlighted piece, that's different, along with the context that is provided through that Wikipedia page. This, by the way, is called grounding an LLM prompt because you're grounding it with some facts and truths. And the response that you get is, in my opinion, pretty factful. So the first response is not bad, but the question is about trust. And the second response is, is based on some relevant knowledge, and therefore the response should be trustable, reliable. But is this fair that we do this uh, manually all the time? It's not. And there has to be some mechanism to do this in automation form. So these three steps, from a technology components now, these lead to these three pieces. The first one is vector database, text embedding, which is a, a, an ML process where you convert a human understandable information into, let's say, numbers or array of numbers, and then the LLM prompt template. And on a high level, the way it works is the information that we need is converted into a vector, stored into the vector database, and then retrieved to be put in a LLM prompt. This method has a name, this architecture pattern has a name called retrieval augmented generation. Three different words, retrieval augmented generation. So let's understand what retrieval is. Retrieval is fancy of saying search. Retrieval is search. But this is a little fancy, really, because if you look at search, search can be of two types. One is a keyword-based search and a semantic search. And what we want is semantic search. What's the problem with keyword search? Given a source of information, you look for cloud ERP, you're going to find a document where the words occur as cloud and ERP. You try to change your search term, modern enterprise platform, and you're not going to find that context. right? And that's a problem. Whereas in the semantic search, if you apply the semantic search on top of it, you are going to be able to find it with not those keywords, but something else. And that's because what semantic search is doing is it's going in a space called vector space and finding words that have closest meaning to the search term to identify which documents might have those relatable terms. Right? So for example, modern can be identified from latest and innovation together. Right? And that's how good context is, is received. So again, remember that the, the objective here was to find good context so that we can apply it in our prompt. From an augmentation perspective, it goes back to our LLM prompt. The LLM prompt template has to be a well-engineered LLM prompt template, and that's where prompt engineering really comes into play. It's not just an ability to write a prompt, but also do a lot of things with the prompt. Okay? So just uh, as an example, just re read the second line here that says, politely say that's unethical, and state the reason for being unethical if the questions fall outside of the ethical bounds. Right? And that's kind of putting some guardrails. And this is just an example. This is not even the way uh, guardrails could, could be or should be put in the system, but I just want to present an example that the LLM prompt is doing a lot of things, and this is one of the things as a responsibility. So the search results that we retrieve from the vector database are injected in this LLM prompt. There is a prompt template with all the other instructions around it. And then the original question is also appended back or injected into the same prompt. And that's where augmentation, and once you give this augmented uh, prompt to the LLM, the generation happens. So to put all of this together in a perspective, just so that you can have a quick understanding of this, I'm going to rush through this a little quickly, is you f uh, from, a, from a RAG perspective, there are two steps. The first step is a knowledge capture piece, and the second is a retrieval and generation. Knowledge capture happens once or twice, a couple of times. The retrieval and generation is where the user lives from a interaction perspective. As once you know what the source of information is, the source of information could be images, videos, text, pages, web pages, but also your database records, right? Enterprise applications. Those can be vectorized, 
converted into numbers, stored in the vector database. By the way, SAP has SAP vector capabilities in the SAP HANA cloud, which is coming soon. You guys have heard that. And then when a question is asked, the question is first converted into a vector. That vector is used for uh, input to the search in the vector database. And whatever results are obtained are updated in the LLM prompt. That LLM prompt is submitted to the LLM engine, and the response is received back to the user. So now, a simple question has context from your reliable sources, has its own techniques to find information from that context and provide you what you want. So if you come back to this picture here, uh, and we overlay the RAG architecture, this is how, so it fits kind of in, in that. And this is how the, the pieces are very similar to the reference architecture that we have previously. The RAG application or the orchestration of the RAG process happens in that application that runs in the runtime. That could also be your application, that could be a bolt-on, sidecar, et cetera. HANA Cloud is used for vector database. And then the foundation model access is used for accessing open AI uh, capabilities. Finally, I also want to point out there is a new role in this, right? In addition to the ML ops, and that is, that is of the prompt engineer. Because as you saw, writing a good prompt is really essential here. And that prompting uh, capability can be provided to prompt engineers, not on ChatGPT, but on a prompt editing platform provided within the BTV platform. Because remember, you might be using an, an, uh, an application or a use case where uh, you might be doing something called as chaining of, uh, of LLM, where you might be uh, using uh, Gemini for one aspect and then OpenAI for another aspect of your, of your, uh, of your uh, use case. All that has to work from a similar single place, and that, that single place is uh, prompt editor within the AI launchpad. So with that, I have a couple of takeaways for you as enterprise architects. Uh, often I know that when uh, we as enterprise architects are challenged with something new, we start with an options analysis, and we get into analysis paralysis. And one of the options uh, many times is do nothing, right, status quo. Folks, there is no, no do nothing in this. Uh, many speakers before me have talked this and stressed this, is AI is a tool that everybody will have. It's a matter of how you use it. So, do nothing is not an option, the first thing. The second takeaway is there are a lot of strategies that you have already prepared and worked on in your organization, maybe. Uh, it is important that you refresh them and give them an AI perspective. For example, data strategies, right? How is data going to be provided for AI? Build versus buy strategies. Are you going to always build an AI application or are you going to rely on the vendors? which capabilities are going to be vendor provided, which capabilities have to be in-house because it's competitive edge. And then the last but not the least is definitely need for governance. And then also, how do you, uh, how do you make sure that there's enough competency in your organization? And with that, I want to thank you. Open up for questions, if there are any. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Sure, so let's go back to the diagram here. So LLMs, large language models are typically in today's status, uh, you know, when you say normally, uh, as, as, a, as a general term, is always something provided by an AI provider. That could be somebody like OpenAI, Gemini, Google, et cetera. That said, there are also many models that require you to be hosting that, those models. Llama, for example. Right? Those need to be hosted. So the AI core will provide you that mechanism to either use the AI from a partner. For example, the open AI that we provide is always provided through Azure, uh, unless Ted can correct me. But then uh, there would be some models that SAP would be hosting on the BTP and allowing you to instantiate them in your tenant so that you can access them. Oh, yeah. So. As, uh, Can you repeat the question, please? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, 
are these um, so the question is are these models going to be updated and and the previous question was uh, how are these models accessed uh, the large language models so uh, yes obviously they are going to be updated uh, and the update schedule uh, uh, is is something obviously going to be depending on the, uh, uh, the the testing that would be required to make sure that it works with the rest of the ecosystem right so I, I don't know if I can, uh, if uh, Ted adds anything else uh, in, the, in the next session or anybody else, you know, we can talk offline on that is what the update schedule is. I don't think we have that, to be honest with you right now. But uh, yeah, there should be a, a practice of version management. The question behind would be, um, that would be basically a blueprint for eliminate fake news. If you transport it a little further. Well engineered, you gather it from certain source places. Is there a QA in between which you put in your Absolutely. Yeah, and um, let me see if I, okay. Um, from, from my perspective, from a product engineering perspective, some of the things that we're doing in the uh, core is to, one is make sure that we follow the uh, AI provider schedules. So OpenAI will release versions of models like GPT 3.5, and they will actually deprecate them so that you no longer have access to uh, you know, GPT 3.50310 or something. So, AI providers will have their own deprecation schedules. So that's one thing we have to keep in mind. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is there will be a lot of different models, and we're going to be building in some benchmarking so that we will be able to give you an idea of how these models are, um, are running on their different um, on, on different types of benchmarks. And then the third is, um, I think in the future, something that we haven't planned for yet is how do we maybe enable you to have your set of benchmark data so that you could test them against various models, for example, to get an idea of um, how they're performing. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. The product development guy speaking is more authentic. One, one sure. So when you said that we can go to OpenAI like as a third party AI provider versus you can maybe decide to build something on top of your own. So there will be an underlying database implication, right? When we're going to OpenAI, the access of OpenAI to you know, years and years of historical data versus when you're building so, so the question is a little complicated, Sandeep. I'll, I'll just repeat that. Uh, the question is, if you, and correct me if I'm wrong, if if the idea is to access OpenAI externally, there will be a mismatch of the data. Or maybe the, the repository that OpenAI AI accesses versus if you're building something in-house, mm -hmm. you will not have access to Correct. Data. Yeah, so if you, if you go to, so I'm repeating the question. If, if you go to OpenAI, OpenAI may not have access to the repositories that we have internally and, and, vice, and, versa. and vice versa, right? So uh, let me bring some clarity to that, right? So uh, LLMs are a model. LLMs are not your knowledge sources, okay? When you access an LLM, you're going to provide it the knowledge source, aka the context. So irrespective of whether you're accessing the OpenAI um, LLM model from OpenAI or Azure OpenAI, or in, internally, any other model, you still need to provide it a prompt. And the prompt will contain uh, those pieces that, uh, that I just showed, which is the context, which is where the information will be. So the knowledge is already there. It's just how you pass it to the LLM model. I hope that answers. Yeah. OK, I have a question here. So uh, we know BTP, right, where B is the business, right? In this diagram, what is the business aspect of the generative AI, AI who? Excellent question. Excellent question. So the question is, uh, and I know you, you said, but I'm just trying to repeat it from my understanding, which is, where is the B, the business part of this, right? And this could be AWS, could be Azure. Where is the B from you guys coming? Oh, yeah, exactly. So, so the B is the, the first piece there, which is business apps. Ultimately, like I, like I started with, right, is the whole aspect is to bring intelligence to the business user, right? And if you are able to use this, uh, if you are able to use this BTP with the BTP components and the AI core, that is ultimately exposed into some business app. And that is where the business interaction is. Because we're not doing this for fun, right? This is not just cool AI with a chat GPT. This is ultimately impacting some business process. And that's why that, I think you've got to think a little deeper is, what are you, you improving from a business process perspective, right? And at that point, an API needs to be called. That happens to be, like any other API, an AI API call. Going here, doing some 
logic, it's telling you back and it's free. Good. Could we just take that uh, exactly. just offline for the question, just right. from a um, switch over time between sessions? Sure, yeah. Well, awesome. That's it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And in about five minutes' time, we'll start up the next session.